and we will see, oh, boom, an instant crash. It's really pretty, isn't it? So let's go analyze that crash together and see what the analysis engine tells us. So the way that I'm going to do that is to open the crash dump in Windabug and so actually I should have just kept stayed there in the VM in the So I've saved that crash away from an earlier execution. I'm going to go to open crash dump, select hierarchical here, the dump file that I've saved away. Oh, you know what? Uh, I, would, I went over that kind of quickly. I went to file and I went to open crash dump. There's lots of other opens in there that might confuse you. This is the hardest part of crash analysis right there. So make sure you get that step right. So the debugging engine is spitting out some stuff. It tells us bug check analysis, use analyze-v for detailed debugging information. Then it gives us this warning about this particular driver, myfault.sys, which is the driver that I wrote, that it can't find symbols for. And then it tells us, look at that, probably caused by myfault.sys. So it actually successfully figured out by looking at that crash that my fault was the problem. Let's do an analyze dash V so we can see what went on underneath the hood. And it also will tell us information about that stop code. Let's scroll up here. And it tells us that this was a driver Urkel not less or equal stop code. Oh, look at that, the most common one. An attempt was made to access a pageable or completely invalid address at an interrupt request level that is too high. And then it even tells us what those different parameters mean. By the way, the, the full list of stop codes are documented in the debugging tools help file. So I'm going to go to the help file, and there's a nice reference in there. The uh, Windows debugging team has done just a fantastic job of making this a place to, a go-to place for crash analysis. So I'm going to pick one here, like IRQ will not greater equal, and let's see what it has for us. It says, Bug check 9, Urkel not greater or equal. The Urkel not greater or equal bug check has a value of 9. This bug check appears very infrequently. You can see that this is a tremendous value for you. <laughs> actually, I'm not being fair. If you actually click on one of these that's more common, like what we just saw, it does provide you some information. But that information is in the debugging engine itself, and we saw some of that information get spit out. So really, you're never going to even need to open this thing unless you just want to go browsing through the stop code reference. You maybe print it out and, you know, so you have it handy for you, bedtime reading. So let's take a look at down here, the stack text area. This is the reason why I've explained the concept of stack usage. You're probably like, what, why is he bothering us with this programming crap? Well, stack, the stack frames of the thread that was executing on the CPU at the time of the crash is the primary resource for the analysis engine for it to be able to make a, a determination that some driver caused the problem. I'm not really sure that I'm happy with what's going on here, though, because you'll see in a second, as I explain to you what the engine did as it looked, this th looked at this thing, why I might be uncomfortable. So it, it started by saying, and you read the stack from bottom to top in terms of what happened first. So the first thing that happened is we entered the kernel from user mode. This is a user mode address. We don't have the user mode stack frames because this is a kernel memory only dump. But the first thing that happened is we entered the kernel, and the then we call this function right here, the mtdevice.control file. The analysis engine is looking at the module that each stack frame is in, and it's saying, hmm, NT. Who made that? Oh, yeah, we did. Oh, we're pretty good, so it's probably not that. Uh, NT. Oh, that's Microsoft's code. Probably not that. NT. Nope. Operating system. Not that. NT. Oh, we already figured out it's not that. Ooh, what's this? Ah, third-party driver. <laughs> probably that guy. So a little bit of racial profiling going on here. <laughs> and that's not quite as simple as really it is, but it does use this and wait, waits each frame on the stack for how probable it is that that component caused the crash. It uses a bunch of other heuristics as well, but that's the basics of it. So that was analyzing an easy crash. The problem is that there's lots of crashes that are just simply not easy to analyze. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you have an uh, audio driver, and you listen to MP3s and WMAs all day long. So you're running this audio driver all day long. 
And one day, that driver happens to go down this execution path that it never goes down normally, where it causes data corruption. It overwrites some other driver's buffer, not its own. That other driver happens to be your CD-ROM burning driver. And you burn CDs maybe once every few weeks to save some of those MP3s. And so the system continues running fine. That's the only glitch that the driver has, and you continue to listen to your MP3s, and you, you might listen for days or days. Your system stays up for, well, it can't stay up for more than a month. But eventually, <laughs> you decide to burn a CD. And now the CD-ROM driver starts to execute, and bam, it trips right on that corrupted memory and causes a crash. And you go to analyze it, and guess who it points the finger at? CD-ROM.sys. The audio driver might not even be in memory anymore because you you know, stopped playing music a few hours ago or a few days ago. You could give that crash to a top CPR engineer and they might look at it and go, hey, the, there's just no information here. We've got corrupted memory. Can't tell who did it. So that's the case of a victim caused crash the system, not the criminal. The, you can detect these kinds of unanalyzable crashes by either the finger being pointed at somebody you know that probably didn't do it, or you get multiple crashes on this machine where the finger's pointed at different drivers in each crash, or it points the finger at a core Windows component. If you see the analysis engine say, NTOS kernel did it, or Win32k.sys did it, or NTFS did it, or another core operating system component, your best bet is to assume that the analysis engine didn't get it right, because it's highly unlikely that those things have bugs in them. I mean, they, they still might, but highly, highly unlikely. So don't trust it. Basically, con consider yourself to have an unanalyzable crash. And your job isn't to go and try to figure out that crash from Your job is to try to transform that crash from an unanalyzable one into one that you can analyze. And the tool that you can use for that is called the driver verifier. How many people have used the driver verifier before? Just a handful of you. And I think that's a real shame that the word isn't out that this is an awesome crash analysis tool. The driver verifier was introduced in Windows 2000. Its primary goal was to improve the quality of third-party drivers. And in the process, it's also improved the quality of Windows itself. See, the thing is, with drivers execute in this privileged mode where the operating system assumes they know what they're doing. And the problem is that a lot of drivers have bugs in them. So if you trust, if you believe that a driver might have a bug in it, you can tell the system, using the driver verifier, to watch that driver's execution really closely and to be paranoid about what it's doing and double check its use of I.O. blocks, its use of memory, and other operations that it performs. I'm going to switch back to the demo machine and let's take a look at the driver verifier. And you get to it, there's no shortcut. You've got to go to the run menu and type verifier. And it launches in a nice GUI uh, wizard here. I don't, I'm not particularly fond of wizards because when you run a wizard, you don't really know what you're getting. So I like to know exactly what I'm getting, and that's especially the case here. So I'm going to take you down the do-it-yourself path, the, hey, I'm advanced enough to be a code developer path. So select that, press next. This is where it has you select, it tries to guide you down the, the, its default path of picking settings for you. Select individual settings from a full list is the option you want. Press next, and here you can see the full list of options. I'm going to talk about, briefly about some of these here. I'm going to save discussion of a couple of them for later. Special pool I'm going to save for later. Pool tracking, not ter terribly useful for most crash analysis. You use this to have the verifier keep track of the paged and non-paged or kernel heap usage of a particular driver. And that might be useful if you're tracking down a leak in a driver. Forced IRQ while checking is worth spending some time on because it's so powerful. See, the thing is, drivers can have a bug where they violate one of those the dispatch level rules and get away with it, and the system never knows it. And the vendor can put their driver through all sorts of stress testing, and it never gets caught. But when they distribute it out to a few hundred thousand customer machines, or a few million even, it's bound to show up, that bug. And here's a scenario that illustrates this. Let me zoom in again. So you have, uh, let's say you're executing along at passive level. Let me just draw right on the screen here. And the driver, at this point, touches a piece of page memory. So this memory, at that point, has to be physically present in the CPU, in the memory, in the RAM, for that access to succeed. It's, if it wasn't there before, it's brought in at this point in time. 
Now, a few instructions later, the driver accesses